Welcome to the Electrify Podcast, episode 101. My name is Matt Teske, and I'm here with Joe Boris, and we're here today to talk about all things e-mobility, ranging from electric Mustangs to electric Harleys. Today's episode has a lot to cover, so let's get this going. So uh, the first ever segment of our first ever podcast, and I think that one of the things that we, we should talk about is obviously for drag racing, EVs make a ton of sense. Electric motors have all their torque on the bottom end. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's cool. We've got the, you know, two of the big three coming out saying, okay, we're going to show you what it means to do drag racing electrified. So I'm kind of curious to see how people respond to, you know, how these, you know, legacy muscle cars are now being turned into, you know, something that's electrified. Yeah. So when we say two of the big three, we're talking about Chevrolet, which uh, at the end of last year, they came out with their e Copo Camaro. Obviously the Copo Camaro in the sixties and seventies, that was the hot drag pack. Uh, now this is not a production car, but it was a show car that they did. And then uh, Ford came out with a new Cobra jet 1400, which again, fully electric. Um, it says in my notes, it is a production car, but I didn't get that sense. Did you get the sense it was a production car? I didn't think so. I thought this was more of a, of a competitive, you know, uppercut or jab back at Chevy. That's kind of how I took it. Um, yeah, I took it the I, same but, way. Yeah, I wouldn't mind it going to production because I think it'd be great. I, I, but it'll be interesting to see, again, they've, they've got that Mustang name now associated with being electric. So, I mean. That's maybe, right. Maybe, You're talking about the, uh, the Mach-E, that SUV crossover thing. Right. And that, and that didn't really speak to the performance people that, you know, I talked to, they said, well, yeah, it's got the Mustang name, but it's not speaking to me like how I've known what a Mustang can be. This is the Cobra jet is right in line with that. So maybe yes, this is the way yes. of kind of answering that question. I, you know, and I just got to say, like, I, I'm just, you know, it, it seems like the, both of those cars have aggravated somebody, you know, uh, <laughs> Like the, somebody's upset about it. Ah, I'm never going to have an electric car. I was going to burn fossils or whatever. Um, but I, you know, I've always found the drag racing guys to be pretty progressive. I mean, you know, when, when you and I were coming up in the nineties, you know, it was, we're talking about multi-valve turbo engines and, you know, front yeah. wheel drive. And, you know, the whole big thing when I was coming up was front wheel drive will never break into the nines. And I mean, like, you know, I was there at the Bush or shootout when the guys started dropping into the eights. So oh, yeah, no, no, it, I think it's, again, it's a changeover. I mean, yeah, back, you know, back in our day, it was, it was, you know, drag racing was in the, in the import world, right? It was, you know, you can't do that with a turbo. And then there was people like, you know, Steph Papadakis and, and, and Ed Bergenholtz that did it. But this is a step from a, you know, from a, a corporate perspective to say, yeah, we can do this electric, but there's been a lot of people building electric drag cars for a long time. I mean, you know, white yeah, zombie. Not like, not like this though, man. These are oh, nothing machines. Close. These are really, I mean, if you look under the hood of the, uh, and this is why we should do a video podcast, but um, if you look under the hood of the uh, Cobra Jet, I mean, it, it looks pretty slick in there, man. Uh, oh, yeah. You know, I mean, it looks like something I'd want to take a picture of. It's not like, you know, when you open up the hood of, of even a modern Mustang, other than the Coyote ones, where it's all plastic and you can't really see anything. I mean, this is like real gearhead, shiny metal stuff. Well, the people they had working on some of these programs uh, from GM Performance's side is, you know, they, Russell Blinas and some of the people from that team, they, they were building some of those, you know, muscle cars and tuner cars back in the 90s and early 2000s. Mm -hmm. So these teams, they know what they're doing. And even how they presented from Chevy's side, they presented that at, at the SEMA show. That was their way of saying, look, we, we know what gearheads have done in the past. This is maybe a new chapter. But I, if I recall correctly, they even had a, an electric crate motor on display that could be used in the future based on, obviously, you got to have the right, you know, power pack involved with that from a battery side. But sure, sure. I think that they're approaching it the right way. And, and so if this is their way of saying it's possible, the next step is obviously for people that want to do it themselves to say, okay, how do I do it by either A, buying that production model and tweaking on it, or how can I retrofit? Yeah, and I think that that's a good point. You know, it, nothing is a production car un, until people want to buy it, right? And you right. get enough blank checks thrown at you, you're, you're going to start building the thing. You know, you're talking about a short distance, it's instant torque. And now the big problem that's facing tracks and the regulation around, uh, you know, the neighborhoods and things like that is the noise regulations. Totally. With yep. an electric right. car, you don't have that issue. Nope. Again, that's where you can, you can basically hear the rubber on, on the road. But aside from that, you have to be in the vehicle to experience what the difference is. I mean, we're hearing that even from just, you know, viral videos you're seeing from people driving in electric cars that want performance. They're saying things like, I don't feel bad now about flooring it and, and using that, that torque that way because I'm not disturbing anybody. So, I mean, it's, it's, it, there's a give and take there from purists, I think. But once you, once you feel that torque and it pulls you back, that changes you with respect to your understanding of what an electric motor does. 
Yeah, no, and you said an interesting word there. You said purist. So there's like obviously there's the drag racing purist that you know they're they're talking about you know old Isky cams and you know SoCal Speed Shop and all that, and then you've yeah. got the Mustang and the Cobra purists. You know, oh, it's got to be rear wheel drive and solid axle. I remember when uh, when I was at SEMA in the '90s and they did the the first independent rear suspension Mustang. The first question out of the box was, "Will a nine inch bolt in?" First question. <laughs> right out of the back so like no you know you have those purists as well yeah you know, that um you know they don't even want to see a multi-valve engine in there so to, yep. to talk about the electric so you know and i've always kind of found myself in this weird position where i consider myself a purist but you know i'm looking at the time slip right like i don't care sure. if this thing has to run on baby seal blood if it's going to get me into the eights <laughs> we're going to do it <laughs> See, that's when the other purists step in and they're like, no, 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 no. That's not what an electric car runs on. You know what I mean? No, it's, no, like, no, okay, no. We're, it's like we're being sarcastic. Do you know what sarcasm is? <laughs> I mean, you know, you're being sarcastic, but at the end of the day, you know, you, you got to do what you got to do if you're trying to win the shootout, right? If, again, at the end of the day, <laughs> no, it's, it's, then you start getting to those cliches. It's like somewhere out in the corner, someone heard you say that. It's like, dude, I care about the time slip. And there's some like Vin Diesel wannabe is like, I don't care if you win by an inch or a mile. But it's no. like, yeah, that's the point. Just remember, baby, point. family, family. It's family. It's family. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if we've exhausted that. I feel like there should be something here about Pitch Black and uh, the Chronicles of Riddick and where that didn't really go, where I wanted it to go. Um, but we should probably move on to the next segment. <laughs> because <laughs> I, <laughs> is that a segue? Uh, that is no, Just, no. That's that's not a segue. A segue is a two wheel device. Okay, never mind. I'm good. <laughs> yeah. uh, so segment two, um, so we're going to talk about the Polestar two. Uh, now, for those of you who don't know about this, Polestar is like, and Polestar is kind of a niche thing. Even car guys don't really know what that's about. So, yeah. Polestar is sort of like the AMG, the Shelby, the um, you know, the go fast performance arm of Volvo. And uh, not the lady parts, Volvo, the Swedish car manufacturer, <laughs> in the same way that Volvo is known for safety and uh, environmental progressiveness, uh, Polestar wants to be known for performance. And Polestar, there have been a number of Volvo Polestars, which were upgrades and tuning products for their mainstream cars. But this is now, we're talking about the company has branched off, it's spun off into its own brand, and they're making their own performance cars. And the, the trick there is that, the gimmick is that they're all electrified, number one, so they're either uh, plug-in hybrids or pure electrics, and then number two, uh, they are, um, you know, basically performance without guilt, right? So it's not going to be a white elephant where you can't take it to, you know, certain parties in LA because people are going to look at you sideways. They're talking about vegan interiors made of recycled materials. Uh, the bodywork is a high percentage of recycled aluminum and plastic. The glass is recycled. So it's it's, you know perfectly at home anywhere you go and uh obviously it's fast well i think i think the cool thing about polestar is that it, it, to your point it's it's to some people it's an unknown and in a lot of ways a lot of these legacy brands that have always made high quality cars they got to figure out how they venture into that space of well this is the next chapter of what we're doing and i think for them to leverage polestar is really smart and on top of which it's just a it's just a cool looking car too i mean polestar one polestar two they're both great looking vehicles um, I think Polestar 2, it's, it's in that vein of Model Y, Model 3. You're going to have people that are you know, shopping for that price of car saying, well, what, you know, what is this? Why, you know, mm. This seems newer. This seems different. And that's okay, especially if they're in, that, if they're in the vein of shopping for that. I think that and by different, I mean like if they're looking for something that's electrified. But even so, they might be drawn to this because it's just a good-looking car. But it's also got the right numbers. I mean, it's got great range. It's got almost 300 miles of range. It's got over 400 horsepower. Mm. I, I think that... I mean, Polestar, the way they've, they've leveraged that, I think is smart. Again, in each of these brands, like we're talking about, you know, for like two of the big three in the last segment, you've got to figure out how do you take these existing uh, brands that have equity, these models or these names you have, and, and spin them in a way that is something that takes you into that next step. And I think, I don't know, I mean, I'm intrigued by Polestar. Do you think it was a good move to, to drop the Volvo name? I mean, people are going to find out who we are eventually. So, like, I am a huge fan of Volvos. I've had Volvos. I love the cars. Um, you know, I, I just, I dig the style. I go to Ikea a lot, the whole Swedish thing. I'm into it. <laughs> Probably something to do with the bikini team when I was a child watching formative commercials. Um, 
but I think <laughs> at, at the end of the day, it, it's, it's, you know, it is taking Volvo to the next step, but is it, is it going to appeal to guys who have always bought Volvos and wanted them to be faster? Or is it going to appeal to someone who maybe would have never thought of a Volvo before sort of like a minivan, right? Like I, I I'm not going to buy a minivan. I'm too cool. So I'm going to buy this, you know, eight passenger SUV and pretend it's not a soccer mobile. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. No, I honestly, I think who's it going to appeal to most because it's causing people to mostly say like, what is this? I've never heard of it. I think that they are leveraging the fact that it's, it is something that will put them into a new era mm -hmm. and we'll, we'll see how that plays. I mean, again, they have announced how they're going to stop development on internal combustion engine. They're leaning into what is going to be things electrified, which is great. So I think it is more so the latter. I think they are looking for the buyers that are interested in what's new. And you've got generations that are upcoming right now that, I mean, I've got nephews and nieces that talk about brands like Tesla because it's their car in the same way that like I have uncles that grew up saying, well, you know, these brands like Chevy, that Ford, they were my car. So I think that there's mm -hmm. some angle there by some of these legacy brands to say, so how do we translate that? So that's the, yeah. my, I mean, my take. Yeah. No. And I, and I think that there's a lot of value to what you're saying there. I mean, you know, we, we talked about, you know, drag racing with the imports in the nineties, you know, when it was Honda and Mitsubishi at the drag strip, very, it was a very generational thing and that sold cars and it sold magazines, right? Just like Ford oh, and totally. Chevy used to. So, yep. you know, I think for Polestar, I, and I hadn't thought of that, honestly, for Polestar to position themselves that way, to be that sort of like, well, what is this? Let me look at this um, and put themselves against Tesla, like you said, with the Model 3 naming. So now this is a two. So is two better than three? Is this like a golf score? Where, what am I looking at? <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. No, I, I think if you look at how a lot of these vehicles coming out are positioned, it's, it's with the intent of making it feel progressive. And, but then it, is it progressive? Mm -hmm. Is it actually different? I think that the, the Polestar brand is the right move, in my opinion. I think a lot of legacy brands should take this type of approach. That's, that's my two cents. Because there's a reinvention element that I think is being missed by, by just attaching it to older names and older brands and older themes. Yeah, now that's, that's really interesting for you to say that. So, you know, going back to the, uh, the electric Camaro, the electric Mustang Cobra Jet, are we, you know, is that holding back the adoption? Of that? I mean, would they have been, would Ford have been better off just making a 1400 horsepower dragster and calling it, you know, the, uh, hell, who the hell, I mean, what would you even call it? The, uh, bring well, back the, catch, the Mercury right? name, right? Yeah. What do you call right. it? Right. Well, there's people that, I mean, I've got friends that have, you know, that have been, you know, GM, you know, fans for years that are saying things like, well, yeah, if, if GM's going to come out with a brand new segment, maybe they should revive Saturn and have Saturn be their electrified lineup, oh, you know, yeah. and, well, but I, I mean, they did that. Right. Cause now they're bringing back Hummer. Well, that's, the, but of all things, right? Like, so this is where I, I think this is a fun topic of, you know, of looking what Polestar is and what, and even like what Ford and, and Chevy have done is this is a branding exercise that all of these companies are having to figure out and how do they fit into the mind of both new buyers and new generation, but also take advantage of leveraging what they have as, as equity with some amazing products that have existed forever. But there's a technological turn of the page they still have to address. Mm -hmm. And so to me, I think that it's, it's, you're, you're seeing it from both sides. You're, you're seeing new vision, like new names like Polestar, and then you're seeing legacy brands say, nope, we've got a lot here. Let's call this the Mustang because Mustangs have always kicked ass. So I think there's something to be said there. I, did we say it? Yes. The thing, to be said, the thing to be said <laughs> is the Polestar, I think, is a cool car. <laughs> it is. It is. So segment three Lime buys boosted boards. In, in the, in the, well, in the, in, the, in the realm of everything electrified, right? And I, I'm looking at what's happening in this space. And, you know, the, this is where you're going to see a lot of, like, you know, the, the bigger animal eating the littler one. But in, in this instance, again, what are they getting out of it? They're getting technology. They're getting patents. They're trying to leverage what's out there that they might not have done to make themselves bolder, better, badder. I'll be curious to see how all the electric scooter stuff shakes out. This didn't shock me hearing about it. Uh, but at the same time, it's, you know, what, where are they taking it? Is it, is it mobility or is it just scooters? What are they going to yeah. do with some of the things that they're going to buy out? And, and a lot of them are trying different things, but right. I mean, but Lime, boosted now, but that's not the, that's not the scooter. I mean, so Lime is the scooter, obviously. Correct, but what yeah. they bought was a skateboard company. Right. That's my point. It's like, what are they going to, how are they going to leverage that? What are they going to do? Is right, this, right, anything right. that's green with Lime on it? I mean, even here in the Northwest, in Seattle, they had, you know, Lime vehicles that you could, that you could go rent that were not obviously a scooter, but also they weren't electrified. And so I was always looking at that thinking, okay, but what's, what's the narrative here? Is it mobility for mobility's sake? 
Is it electrified mobility? It'll be interesting. Wait, so you mobility. guys had these? So so if, if you like have been living under a rock for the last year, the, these scooters, these are like electric scooters that are they're yeah. in like these rental kiosks. They're all over the cities. It's here in Portland. They're not docked on like like kiosks or stations. They're just anywhere. Like you, like people that are going and charging them, they bring them back and put them anywhere. So I think that there's a level of frustration from some people that are like, yeah, they're just kind of everywhere. But there's a bunch of people I do know that use them. And so huh. I, I'm, I'm just curious as to what the next step is going to be. Is it, it's purely urban in that sense, I think. I think there just still needs to be a, an understanding of where are you guys taking this mobility for mobility's sake conversation. Um, I think that the scooter approach is, it has some benefits, but if it rains and snows, they don't. You know, so there's, there's, a, there's a balancing act to be made about where these things are taking us. But I think that Lime saying we like that this had consumer support and excitement behind it. We want it as part of our brand. I totally get the business move. Yeah, I, I, I agree with, I agree with everything you just said there. Um, my, my only, and I, I, this is not a, this is not an accept. This is an, in addition to, I think that like, there is definitely a segment of the population that like thinks skateboarding is cool, but we've, we've gone beyond like the skinny skater punk kid of the eighties and early nineties. And like, everyone's fat now. So like, <laughs> I, I'm having a similar identity crisis like right now. Like, so, you know, everybody's, you know, shelter in place in Illinois. I'm in Chicago. Uh, so we're shelter in place until the end of May. So everybody's riding a bicycle, right? I always yeah. rode BMX bikes as a kid, as a, in college, I rode BMX and uh, you know, I'm in my forties now I got kids. <laughs> you don't want to be that bike. guy on the scooter. Is that what you're no, telling me? And I'm like, and it's like, what I really need is like, you know, one of those comfort cruiser bikes with like the big pushy seat. <laughs> <laughs> and like the coaster brakes, but like, I can't do it. So I'm like, like, I just, I can't pull the trigger on one of those. Like that's my minivan, right? Like I can't, exactly. yeah, I can't do it. I can't do it. Where like, you know, I, I feel like I could still skateboard, but like I would get tired. So maybe an electric skateboard, you know, I, I could mentally it, rationalize that. It and helps it, you like, along. Like it propels you and you're feeling cool. Yeah, right. like yeah, because I mean, nobody looks cool kicking the skateboard, and it's like what? It's like fourteen, fifteen hundred bucks. I've pissed away more money than that on dumber things. Well, there's, I mean, honestly, that's the other thing too. Is is a lot of this is designed around being, you know, cost effective for people, and it's like you know, access to mobility that is electrified. I mean, I I talk to a lot of city planners and a lot of people from a policy perspective all the time related to what this is doing for communities. And, but the technology on some level too, like, yeah, like a thousand dollar, $1,500 one, if you want to buy it, that's, that's not cheap. Like that's an investment, you know? And so again, the shared level to it, the access to it makes sense. But that's why I'm thinking, yeah, for Lime's sake, I'll be curious to see how they leverage this. It's not going to yeah. be as easy to just go rent an electric skateboard. Are they just going to start opening up a, you know, an e-commerce site where you can buy this stuff? Is that the point? I mean, I'll be curious. I mean, so again, I'm, I, don't, I don't dislike them hundred percent. I don't love them. I, I just look at it and I think to myself, what, what was Lime's goal here and, and how's it going to benefit people that, that really need this type of option, you know? I mean, if ah, that goes. So I, I think we've covered Lime buying those. I, I think they're cool, man. I don't know. I just, I, I think it, again, it's such it's, a big question mark. Like, is it a good move? Is it a bad move? I don't know. Let's, let, let's well, move how, on. How, yeah, let's, let's, let's move on. And we'll talk about more unicorns in the mobility sector later. So segment four, <laughs> speaking of unicorns, the $30,000 Harley Davidson Livewire electric motorcycle and uh, the recently revealed Zero SR slash F. Uh, both of these bikes are pretty similar on paper. They are, you know, electric bikes. They are kind of sporty standards. Uh, what we would have called UJMs back in the eighties for uh, those of you who are a thousand years old. I think it's funny. The, like, the idea of, okay, we're talking about like, you know, Oh man, how long ago was that? And the idea, so what is Harley Davidson doing in this, in, in the, in the space of electrification? There's some people that are like, is this, is this changing that brand? You know, is, is it, is it wrong? And I don't think so. I think the live wire is awesome, but what's, what's going to play out there? Well, I think you had, you know, for, I, I want to say, I mean, Harley Davidson's a hundred 150 almost 120 year old company and i think for probably a hundred of those years they looked at themselves or or the buyers of harley davidson were an exclusive group and i'm using that term yeah. exclusive as like we are us you are you uh where now you have you know that that rider base that that i mean let's not even talk about demographics and rider base let's just talk about 
that idea of what is cool is very quickly going away. Oh yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, and, and not for nothing, South Park did more damage to that brand <laughs> in 23 minutes. Then South Park like, has, a, South Park has a knack. If, if they, if they attack what oh, you're thinking. Buddy. <laughs> the point is we've got these two bikes that are um, sort of similar on paper, but they're not. One of them yeah. is half the price of the other. You know, on paper, the zero has it all. It's less money. It's better range. It's more top speed. It's got faster charging time. I think that there's something to be said. Again, I'm, I'm an enthusiast from, you know, what do I want to see myself, you know, in when I'm driving a car or riding when I'm on a motorcycle. And to me, the live wire speaks to a certain level of, you know, quality that, and, and it's not the Harley image either because it's a complete, it feels different than a Harley Davidson. I don't see yeah, the live wire. To me, it, it could, you know, going back to the Volvo Polestar conversation, they could have called it anything and it would have been a right. beautiful, beautiful machine. I mean, if yeah. you really look at it, um, you know, the, the, so I've been lucky enough to have a lot of access to live wires. Um, you know, and it, the frame is like these beautiful sand castings. The welds are beautiful, but you hardly see any welds because they have like these really complicated, either they're CNC'd or they're cast pieces that just really, you can't do that kind of bike. I don't think you could build that bike for 12 grand, which is what you'd have sure. to build it for to sell it for 16 or 20, right? Right. I, I, I don't think you could do it. And it, it's got nothing to do with the technology. It's all in the, uh, you know, oh, the, craftsmanship. Of a, the, the craftsmanship. Yeah. For lack of a better term for in the craftsmanship. And, you know, I was never, I was never a Harley guy until a couple of years ago. I was, you know, always a Honda guy and I would, you know, make fun of the Harley guys, you know, for, for all the same reasons that South Park did. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't until I was at a stunt ride in St. Louis and this dude had this big Harley trike and I was like, hoo, 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 what's this guy going to do? And then this dude popped this thing up in a wheelie and started like doing circles. Cause he had like a one wheel break and he's just like, oh, and I was just like, this guy is awesome. And then I saw a YouTube video <laughs> of a dude drifting a Harley tri-glide, like drifting this trike. And I was like, cool, that's how I'm going to die. And you know, <laughs> now that's, that's the way that I have chosen. And now I love Harleys and you know, this live wire is just, is just part of that. But I, I agree with you hundred percent. It is not, it's not that biker guy. It's not that sons of anarchy, you know, no guy at all. It's, it's <clears throat> someone else. And it, it's kind well, of, it's, it's funny. It's like, I, 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 to, I think it, well, it's interesting. It's well, here's the hard part, right? Is it skipped a generation for how it's designed, how it looks, all the different details that go behind it, but it didn't skip the generation's pocketbook. Like the people yes. that might be most attracted to the live wire can't get it. They just can't, you know, this is it, it, the price point it's at. It's still going to be a certain type of buyer. And are those buyers buying it? You know, and then for zero, I've got a friend, you know, he's, he's been riding Ducatis for years, but he's looking at zero because he's like, I can afford that. You know, he's like, I can get into that for something that's not going to break the bank, but he's, you know, that's just his position, but he's also a, a younger demographic. So. Yeah, I, I think that's fair, but you know, it's a first year product and Harley cannot escape. They can't escape their own. I don't want to say history, but I want to say memory. They can't escape their own memory, right? Like a first year Harley Davidson fat boy is worth infinitely more money than a second year fat boy. A right. 2003 anniversary model is worth twice as much as an 04 versus an 02, right? Like it, it Harley kind of knows that. And that first year 2020 live wire, I think is priced at a premium. I think next year you'll see, if not an explicit price drop, you'll see cash on the hood or uh, I guess on the fender in this case. And you'll yeah. see the transaction price be around, you know, maybe 25 because that's, that's oh, how they cool. do stuff. And at 25, mm -hmm. it's still pricier, but you know, you're talking a 15% drop in price. Yeah. It's, and you still get that federal, uh, or you may or may not get a, a tax credit on that. I think it's doable. Oh, to, at that point, yeah. I, I think, it, again, to your point about the, the, the statistics on Malone, like for just, okay, one's got a little bit more range than the other. One's got a legitimately higher top speed than the other. The, but then it comes down to filling up. Like the live wire, because of how fast it can charge compared to the Zero, if you're going to go out and cruise, it, it, just by sake of the, by what you're riding on, it's going to take you longer. I mean, that's, that's just, you know, part of how it's going to go. But at the same time, 
that's part of why we need diversity in product lines. We need to know that people are having choices. These are two very distinctly different choices in my opinion. And then maybe Harley comes out with something that's not the live bar, but something more, maybe lighter, more efficient and more akin to what a zero is. And maybe zero decides to build something more robust. Who knows? Again, that's, that's what might happen in time. So this is not, this isn't apples to apples in my opinion, in a lot of different ways. Yeah, I agree with you hundred percent. I, th I think these are two different products. Something positive. I think the cool thing walking away from what we're seeing and everything we talked about today is you've got, you've got high performance enthusiast products. You've got production products. You've got mobility options. And you've also got uh, this, just this spread of, of brands that are all engaged on what's happening with electrification. And they're all addressing it and approaching it in a way that they are seeing as best. And we're going to see this keep playing out. But I think the evidence of what we talked about today is that it is everywhere. Electrification is a it's whole everywhere. part of the conversation. That's a wrap for this episode of the Electrify Podcast. Be sure to find out more information about Electrify Expo on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn to get information on all things e-mobility. We'll see you next week.